will now move to the motion before the House this evening, which is, this House believes that austerity has been Europe's worst policy of the century. I now look to the first speaker, Nicholas Lea, uh, Lincoln College, to open the case for the proposition. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, honorable members and distinguished guests. It is an immense honor to be speaking in this historic chamber tonight, 10 years on from the Great Recession that followed the worst and deepest global financial crisis in our lifetimes. This debate is both timely and much needed. For many of you here, I'm sure, a debate about a subject as dry as economics and public finance hardly sets your hearts racing. The very word austerity comes from the ancient Greek, austeros, meaning bitter or harsh taste. Well, that's certainly how the public in Greece view the term. But in an age where austerity has been well and truly entered the political lexicon of discourse in Europe, this is exactly the sort of debate that we should be having. The privilege of speaking first, of course, tonight is that I get to interrogate the motion before anyone else and judiciously delimit the parameters of the debate. So let's remind ourselves of the motion. It reads, this house believes that austerity has been Europe's worst policy of the century. Well, first and foremost, to be absolutely clear, we are discussing the 21st century uh, and therefore the last 18 years. If this was the last 100 years, I'm fairly certain we could all go home now, the opposition would win and off we go. Europe may have done some worse things last century. Um, but in this sense, this is indicative of how far we've come. And we need to contemplate what is at stake for a continent that has enjoyed unprecedented levels of peace and dialogue. So what do we really mean by austerity? We know the semantics of the word are synonymous now with pain, suffering and hardship. But austerity is not some perennial state of macroeconomic affairs. It is the deliberate design of policymakers looking to cut and deleverage a nation's debt burden via an aggressive budget deficit reduction program, which takes the form of cuts to public expenditure. It's one of the many catalogue of options available to central governments and central banks in bearing down on a nation's debt. The origins, in fact, of the British national debt alone uh, is an historical idea. It emerged in the late 17th century uh, with the development of the Bank of England. Um, of course, during the reign of William III, the stadtholder of the Dutch Republic. Naturally, it all began with the European. However, present-day austerity in the European context, driven principally through the institutional mechanics of the European Monetary and Economic Union, is something quite different. Something far more delusive, far more divisive, and far more dangerous than ever before. Now, the operative word in this debate is worst. It's important that we get this right. This presupposes the comparative. If we were to characterize a policy implemented on a continental level as the worst in a century of history, what might we expect to see? Well, I suggest three distinct criteria. Number one, something wholesale and doctrinaire. Number two, something designed for efficiency, but without heart. And number three, something that attempts to remedy short-term problems only to sow the seeds of longer-term ones. So the austerity measures implemented by the nations of Europe during the Great Recession and most strongly in the Eurozone periphery of Southern Europe do indeed meet these criteria. And I'll be attempting to explore not whether austerity is a good or a bad policy, something we need, something we don't need, but rather, based on what we know, this should be a historical reassessment of the policies still being out, carried out in Europe today that almost began a decade ago. But before I proceed with my case, Mr. President, it falls on me to introduce the guest speakers on both sides of the House in this evening's debate. Opening the case for the opposition is Marie, Maria Louis Albuquerque, the former Portuguese Minister of State and Finance and a former member of the Board of Governors for the European Investment Bank. Following her, we will hear from Ruri Quinn, the former leader of the Irish Labour Party and a former Minister of Finance. Closing the case for the opposition is Joaquin Almunia, the former leader of the opposition in Spain and a former vice president of the European Commission. Joining me on the esteemed proposition benches, <laughs> firstly, we have Dr. Ioana Petrescu, a Romanian economist who served as her country's minister of finance. She has also worked as a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington before becoming an assistant professor at the University of Maryland. 
And finally, closing the case for the proposition is Bill Emmett, the former editor-in-chief of The Economist and the author of 12 books on politics and economics, including the much-revered work published last year, The Fate of the West. I can only hope that my speech will do justice to the eminence of the speakers we have joining us tonight. I look forward to hearing all of your contributions. These are your guests, Mr. President, and they are indeed most welcome. It's the 15th of April 1912, just over 100 years ago, high up on the main mast of the RMS Titanic on a still North Atlantic sea, two adult night watchmen suddenly sight an iceberg. Just over 30 seconds later, the ship's hull makes impact with the ice and the fate of the Titanic was thenceforth sealed. Why, I hear you ask, do I mention one of the most successful films of all time and one of the greatest tragedies in maritime history? Well. The sinking of the Titanic could well serve as the metaphor par excellence for the economic and social crisis that has gripped countries in Europe this last decade. First, there was the issue of the hubris, the fatal flaw. The captain of the ship, one Mr. E.G. Smith, symbolic here of austerity, I'm doing my best, ordering a cruising speed that in the context of the warnings that he had been receiving was palpably unsafe. Second, there was the issue of neglect as the SS Californian, symbolic here of Europe's policy makers, today and in the past, which was only eight miles away, might have intervened, but disregarded the Titanic's frantic signals of distress. Third and finally, there was the issue of class and money, symbolic of the citizens of Europe today. The rich had easy access to the Titanic's lifeboats, while the poor struggled to find their way to the upper decks where these were found. I want you to keep this analogy firmly fixed within your mind during my speech, because the fiscal austerity put in place by European policymakers after the Great Recession was a stubbornly wholesale and doctrinaire policy that ignored all the warning signs and the teachings of the past. Austerity, when implemented during the eye of a recession fueled storm, can be self-defeating. In a recession, governments that pursue an aggressive budget deficit reduction program with the aim of bearing down on their debt to GDP ratios have seen a large fall in nominal GDP. Take the example of Greece in 2011. Huge cuts were made, GDP fell by 6%, people's incomes fell, meaning that their creditworthiness fell, less spending took place, which in turn led to a contraction of tax revenues and the debt to GDP ratio still continued to rise. And according to the official statistics from Trading Economics, that figure now stands at an enormous 179%. Though extreme, Greece is not some exceptional case. Portugal and Italy both have ratios of 126% and 132% respectively, and those figures have been on an upward trend since 2010. But what does this tell us? A recession is clearly not the time for austerity. As John Maynard Keynes taught us, but we have chosen to ignore, austerity should only be properly pursued when there is strong economic growth as a deflationary policy. It seems that Europe's policymakers, and in particular those that make up the Troika, the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, have forgotten how the economic machine actually works. An economy is simply the sum of all the transactions in all of its markets. Income has to be equal to expenditure in an economy because every transaction has a buyer and a seller. GDP, then, is the measure of the total income and expenditures of an economy. Now, enthusiastic austerity and belt tightening might work on a micro level. Corner shops, businesses, households, they should all practice austerity. Why? Because of the perfect independence they have between income and expenditure. I'll give you an example. If you go to the members' bar tonight and opt for tap water instead of one of the many enticing cocktail specials entertainingly read to you by our secretary here, then you have saved money and you haven't reduced your income. When governments practice large-scale spending cuts through austerity, they immediately cut their own nation's GDP, because as we know, a nation's total expenditure is equal to a nation's total income, which makes people wealthier and thus more creditworthy and allows extra borrowing. And round we go! With the right checks and balances, the economy gets moving again. You cannot make a business grow alone through cutting. Investment's needed, and this should apply to an economy. Now, we move to the heart of the issue here. Austerity in Europe is the greatest triumph of the forces of capital over the common good in modern times. 
or as Mike Blath has called it, the greatest bait and switch where the private debts of the banking systems of the developed world were bailed and recapitalized via the public sector balance sheet. Like the disaster of the Titanic, the poorest people of the weakest nations have suffered the most from the debt-fueled, unbalanced excesses of the bankers in 2007 and 2008. Lacking the financial assets of the wealthy, there have been no lifeboats, no cause for hope or reason to be saved. The human cost of widespread cuts in government spending must not over be overlooked here. It's all too easy to be seduced by normalised expressions such as living within our means, getting our house in order and belt tightening. Now, I'm an historian, which means my argument is only as good as my evidence. Well, let me just read you a few statistics. and I want you to ponder in what context anyone could welcome these circumstances as acceptable. Youth unemployment in Greece right now is at 45.5%. It's 35% in Spain, 32% in Italy. The EU's own survey on income and living conditions found that 13.5 million people are experiencing food insecurity, being unable to afford basic meat and vegetables every second day. People are experiencing a major depressive episode because of firm closure or lack of employment opportunities. That is up by 12.3% this year. Meanwhile, access to healthcare is getting harder, schools are ballooning in size, real wages are falling, living standards are falling, and most heartbreakingly of all, homelessness is in its highest point on record in Europe. In this country alone, one in every 200 people find themselves without a roof over their heads. You might say these figures are cherry-picked and don't tell us or simply cannot explain the full story, but they do give you a flavour of the devastating reality of an economic idea, and that's what it is. Pan-European austerity has put immense strain on public services from health, welfare, education, policing, construction, transport and so on. With inequality and poverty on the rise, Europe is facing a lost decade, just like Japan did in the 1990s. The European austerity programmes bear a chilling resemblance to the ruinous structural adjustment policies put in place after the debt crises in Latin America, Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa in the 1990s and 1980s. Global charities like Oxfam, originating from Oxford of course, have forecast an additional 15 to 25 million people could face the prospect of living in conditions of absolute poverty by 2025. How is this acceptable? Although the socio-economic effects of austerity are indefensible, just as concerning is the socio-cultural impact. The political myopia shown by Europe's policymakers has arguably been as senseless as their economic policies. For economic policy to succeed, it must be understood and accepted by the general public. Communicating with people in a language they understand, the reason why things are as bad as they are and how things could be improved is something the Troika and the national governments of Europe have failed to do. Their stubborn refusal to do this has only served to loosen the confidence of the people in their governments and expose gaping fault lines in the internationalist agenda. Economics alone cannot drive policy. Disgruntlement and social unrest in Europe is not reducible to an accounting exercise of pros and cons. It is as much about people's understanding of the system and knowledge of an alternative to the current institutional order. In this context, you can see how austerity is perceived by many citizens in Europe as a constraining dystopia. I'm sure you're all familiar with Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. As the director of the Hatcheries and Conditioning explains, creating a harmonious and cooperative society requires making people believe like their inescapable social destiny, liking what you've got to do. EU citizens on the receiving end of austerity are experiencing a similar conditioning exercise. An erosion of public trust has a twofold negative social impact. Not only does it create dualities of expression and identity, rich and poor, us and them, the many and the few, but it also precipitates the endogenous conditions for darker political forces to seize power. Now, it is incumbent on Europe's political elite to be honest with its citizens and to reform its failed experiment of austerity. So one final point. If the opposition is to win the debate this evening, then they must do two things. On the one hand, they must show that austerity taken as a policy that has been implemented across Europe has worked on a wide scale, not just in the context of a few isolated examples. On the other hand, and much more importantly, if they are to make the case that austerity is not the worst policy formulated by Europe, then what is? The comparative presupposition of this motion means they must identify politics and policies that have been even worse. There are many spectres haunting Europe right now, 
One, in particular, is the spectre of failed capitalism that takes the form of austerity. It is not an inevitable consequence of tough economic times. It is an intellectually bankrupt economic idea that has been put into place by our policymakers. The economy is far too important for us. We cannot leave it to the economists and the financial experts. We need to understand how ideas shape it. So I urge you, on such a tempestuous evening of thunderstorms and rain, to redirect course, to prevent the sinking of the Titanic, and to support the proposition this evening. Thank you very much.